I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Martin, um, who uh, is one of the one of the four uh, finalists for this can chancellor candidate position. Um, for folks online, um, we are streaming this, so and it will be recorded. Uh, for folks online, uh, we'll have an opportunity to answer questions later. So just be cognizant of the email on your screen about where to email questions. Um, we'll have an opportunity for Dr. Martin to in introduce herself, speak maybe about her vision, uh, vision for UAF, um, and for us to get to know her. And then we'll open up to questions and answers, and then we'll uh, wrap it up um, with uh, some some final words from Dr. Martin. Um, so with that, uh, I'll hand it off. We should hopefully have a, be having more students flood in as, as the day goes on, um, as the forum goes on. Um, so we'll look for that, but Thank I'll you. hand it off to you. Thank Thanks. you so very much. So thank you all for being here this morning. Um, I have just a couple of things as far as vision are concerned so that you know what I have shared with the faculty and the staff as far as why um, I, I am interested in uh, the <coughs> University of Alaska Fairbanks. First of all, I'd like to say thank you for those of you who put up with me for the past couple of days, uh, and actually longer than that, Samuel. Um, <laughs> Um, the welcome that John and I, my husband, John is back here, that we've received is, is second to none. And that's from students who've taken time to, to stop to say hello, from students like him who came in, he's a Fort Hay student, and wanted to say hello uh, to me. And he has transferred here from my previous institution to follow his dream here at the University of Alaska at Fairbanks uh, to, to everyone that we have met. Um, you know, uh, what, is, what has become very clear is that uh, the University of Alaska at Fairbanks is a welcoming community. Uh, it is a place that where education is outstanding and where education needs to continue to be accessible and innovative. I love the idea of the fact that this university is a transformational catalyst for Alaska, for the Arctic region, the nation, and the world. The fact that the research that is conducted here provides the knowledge that we can use to preserve our world and better the quality of the lives, especially your quality of life, because you are the next generation of leaders. And it is clear to me that the people here are devoted to doing what is right. They're devoted to each other to this region and to the distinctiveness Alaska style and to clearly this university. UAF is a place with a global outreach and impact, yet it has a local heart. It's a place that's destined for preeminence because of its people, because of you. You are going to be going out into the world. You will become this university's greatest alumni you will become this university's greatest advocate because you have experienced firsthand the ability, the intellect, the passion, the knowledge and the experience of distinctive faculty and caring staff. And that's what you're taking out into the world. I believe that um, this university needs a hands-on leader to inspire and to tell your story, a leader who can unite the institution across a broad spectrum of programs who can successfully seek external sources of income to mitigate the cuts that are going on in state funding. We cannot levy the state funding cuts on your backs, on the backs of students. Throughout my life, I have and I will continue always to ensure that students have an accessible and affordable education, a quality education, a superb education, because that's what you deserve. As an immigrant to this country, I know firsthand the value of edu education. You see, I came here not being able to speak a word of English. Together with my grandmother, my sister and I, on Sundays after church, we go out and clean houses. Like many of you and many of your peers, I went to school full-time and I worked a full-time job. But education is transformational. And because I went to school my siblings went to school, I'm the oldest, the other three went to school, and our children went to school. And because of education, even my children and many of my nephews and nieces now have not just a baccalaureate degree, but they also have graduate degrees. My daughter will be graduating in two weeks with a PhD. 
there will be another Dr. Martin in the family. <laughs> but it's because of education that I am here. It's because of education that I want to pass it forward. While many of you may think that my children think, and you are the age of my children, that I was born when dinosaurs roamed the earth. <laughs> I remember sitting in your seats not so long ago. I remember wondering where, whether I was making enough money to put food on the table or to buy a book. I was wondering how I was able to juggle the demands of a strong academic and rigorous curriculum at Duke with the needs to work a full-time job. And then during the summers, I worked two full-time jobs. I remember. And that's why I am here, and that's why I am committed to ensuring that you have access to the American dream that I am living today. And the reason I'm living that dream is because of education. For some of you, you're just finishing your baccalaureate. That should be the beginning of your journey for the next degree, for the next lifelong adventure of learning. Education will open doors. Education is the key to your future. As you all well know, this university and this state is undergoing budget crisis. We need to strengthen our university's commitment to a, a superb education. As your chancellor, it is my responsibility and will be my priority to give our people the resources to continue to be excellent and the skill and the training to be successful. It will be to protect and augment our funding sources. It will be to be fair, to be accessible, to be transparent. It will be to act decisively with one voice, your voice, the voice of the people of the University of Alaska at Fairbanks. My job as your chancellor will be to create and implement strategies that will allow us to, Im to work in the present while we continue and begin to implement initiatives aimed to control in a more fiscally responsible manner our destiny. My responsibility will be to attract new investors to the university and to be your greatest advocate. It will be to create new transformational models aimed to increase and generate new sources of income through education. I am here today because I remember what it was like to want to grow, to desire to make an impact in the world. And because people opened their hearts and helped me by opening doors by showing me the way, by faculty who actually wrote a check to an application that got me to Duke University. That's why I'm here today. You are the reason, you the students, are the reason why I get up every morning. I remember not so long ago what it was like, and I am determined that for you, your life will be better you will live in a world that hardly resembles the world from which I graduated. A world with education is a means to success. A world that is brought together in a global marketplace. A world where knowing and knowledge and its application yields the ability for a meaningful career. That's what the people of UAF do here. That's what faculty and staff are, are determined to provide you, a superb and excellent education, laden with research opportunities that are nowhere else in the world. Your role is to be able to notice those opportunities, to seek them, to embrace them. You will have to work hard, but with sacrifice, comes great benefits. My responsibility as a chancellor will be, though, 
to walk alongside with you, to look for those, those doors that I can open and to open them for you so that you can walk through them, so that you can make the meaningful impact that you are destined to make in this world. So I thank you for coming here today. I wish you the very best as many of you begin your finals next week. And for those who are graduating who may be seeing this online, I wish you Godspeed. And I wish you that you will continue to make the difference in the world that you're destined to make. I often tell people that I have great expectations and great hopes for your generation. You see, my generation was more concerned about me, myself, and I. Your generation is a generation that thinks of others before self. It's a generation that is willing to work hard and to give back. It's a generation that's concerned with sustaining our resources and making sure that the Earth's resources are here for, the, for your children and your children's children. Your generation is concerned about impacting the world, about doing service activities and helping others, either by going through um, Teach for America or other activities, mission activities. You think of others before self. Continue to do that because that's the only way that we can make this world better. I'm not, I don't think I am all that far by saying that I really do believe that your generation, because of who you are, because of where your heart is, because your commitment to service and to serve each other will be, might just be the generation that will be able to find peace in this world by working together with each other, with people across lands, because you see yourself as enablers not as being able to create differences. You see the similarities and the opportunities as opposed to the differences. So continue to see the glass half full, not half empty. That is your choice. So choose to be proactive. Choose to have a voice for those who often cannot have one. Choose to pass it forward. Remember what it felt like, like I do, sitting and wanting and needing. And when you get to where you are getting, remember to pass it forward. My grandmother used to say, when you get to the penthouse, remember to send the elevator back down. So when each of you gets to the penthouse, which I know you will, remember to send that elevator back down. So thank you for taking your time away from studying, <laughs> for visiting with me today. So. Questions. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see the, 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 the penthouse quote appearing on some Facebook pages <laughs> later today. So, um, and thank you for giving us this break from studying uh, to hear uh, the wonderful words that you have to share with us. Um, so now we will open up to questions. So as I mentioned earlier, um, if you are viewing this online, you can email questions in. Um, uh, and we have folks in the room that I, I'm sure have questions as well. So um, we can take the first question. Oh, two online. Okay. I guess we'll go online then. <laughs> <laughs> so our first online question is, coming from a first generation and limited income background, what resources and support would you dedicate to TRIO programs at UAF serving students from the same background? You know, the, the, the plight of first generation students the plight of any student is great, but of first generation students of underserved communities is even greater because if you don't know what you don't know, you don't know what you don't know. You know, if, if, if when you get to, to, to college, you don't know where to seek help with tutoring or where to seek help with, with um, um, anything that pertains to college, whether it's library resources, whether it's research resources, whatever. You don't know. And oftentimes, people are embarrassed to ask somebody else because they feel that, well, they, maybe they think I don't belong here. Maybe they think this is something that is, that I should know. 
And so creating opportunities that are not just driven to first generation students, but that benefit students as a whole is important because then if students are in that group, then they're part of a whole, okay? So for example, at my previous institution, we implemented um, a three credit course, which was a, a required course. Originally it was optional and we decided it wasn't working optional. Um, it, it, so it became a required three credit course for all incoming students, freshmen or transfer students. And so while some of the things may have seemed basic to some, for others they were important. So part of the, the three credits was taking a trip to the library and going through all of the databases and being told these are the databases and these are the people that can help you. Or to going to the behavioral uh, intervention center and saying this is your counselor, this is where you can go if you're sick. Or s walking over to the tutoring center or the, to the career center. They're little things that some of us take for granted, but for somebody who's never done it, we don't know what we don't know. You know, when I was applying to go to college as a first generation student, I didn't know even where to apply. You know, how do you begin to apply? How do you, how do you figure out where to, to, to get financial aid or where to apply for, for grants? There has to be support. But that support should not just stop after the first semester. It needs to be ongoing. And so there needs to be outreach to first generation students to get them to the university. Um, one of, uh, an initiative of which I'm very, 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 very proud of, it's a Hispanic College Institute. It is an institute that I created almost 10 years ago in Virginia. And it was designed for first generation Hispanic students. At that time, the Hispanics in Virginia were the fastest growing population, but yet they were not going to college. Okay, again, if you don't know what you don't know, you don't know how to get to college. And so it was a four day, three day, four day, three night event on the campus of the university run by volunteers. And during those four days, we gave the students uh, skill sets to be able to be successful in college from mock interviews to writing the application to having the application essay to having competitions um, on issues and how to bring them to action so that they would become um, student senate presidents, giving them opportunities for leadership. And during those four days, we got them together. We created a, a, a system of a family, of a relationship. We put students in groups of five, five boys led by a lead, uh, a, a young man who would be already in college or the girls the same way. And that sustained itself. We took surveys. The pre-survey was a couple of questions, one of which was, do you think you can go to a college? About 92, 94% incoming said no. The next question was, what's your GPA? The minimum requirement for entry into this institute was a 3.0, okay? The average GPA was a 3.5. We had students with a 4.0, okay? Remember, over 92% said they didn't know, they couldn't go to college. <clears throat> We brought in field experts, we brought in faculty who instilled in the students a passion for the liberal arts and for STEMs and for linguistics. We held career fairs in, in the college to open the doors of knowledge to the students so that they knew the majors that would be available from petroleum to geophysics to linguistics to engineering to pre-med to pre-law to whatever. <laughs> And yes, and the faculty and staff rolled up their sleeves and went to work and opened the world for them. And then we went ahead and had competitions so some of our students could compete for scholarships to come to the university, whether it was talent, whether it was coming up with a, uh, we had an issues to action, they identify an issue that was prevalent in their community and they design a solution for that action. And then they got money to come to school if the first, uh, one, first second, and third uh, places got scholarships to come to the university. And the number one, we had underwritten some of it with a local benefactor that they actually got uh, money to go back to their communities to implement 
this action for the issue that they had come up with. When they left four days later, they came in as strangers. Four days later, they left as a family, not only with each other, the students, but with the family of the university, with the staff, with the faculty of the university. And so we submitted again the post survey, the same set of questions as were asked before. And the questions, can you get to college? 100% of those students said yes. The track record of those institutes, and we have been keeping track with them, 89% of the students that came in through that HCI went on to college and graduated from college. Two years ago, the, one of the first students in the very first cohort received his PhD and has now launched his own small business in, in, in biomedical engineer. That student will tell you the story. He was <coughs> one of the one who said, I cannot get to college. So there are opportunities. And that institute was specific to Hispanic, but it's, a, it's for first generations. And the only thing that we called it Hispanics is because we were just trying to attract that specific. That institute could be, could be flipped for the native Alaska population to keep, to, to, to understand, so that they understand their specific needs and they understand that we understand their specific needs and we create a pipeline. That can be done for first generation students of any backgrounds. If you don't know what you don't know, you don't know what you don't know. The reason why you're here is to know what you don't know, <laughs> but you have to get here first. So thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, any questions from the room? Hey, so you've talked a lot about how you have great vision. I can definitely see you've got a lot of passion for this subject. So I was wondering, um, for instance, let's say in the first year of being a chancellor, how do you envision applying some of these principles and some of these things that you've talked about? Like what, what kind of programs would you want to put in place? What kind of things would you like to offer? I was just curious what you had to say about that. Well, the first thing that we need to do is figure out how to hemorrhage, how to stop the hemorrhage of the cuts. That's job one. Um, you know, I, I'm the type of person that it would be presumptuous of me to say to you, this is what I'm going to do, okay, because I'm not here. What I can tell you is that what I will do is we will have lots of meetings, lots of gatherings, small gatherings, not on TV, uh, not being board scott so that you have you f you feel confident of telling me what you don't want me to know okay because you know you may be afraid of having the world see it but one-on-one -on -one, you can tell me and i've said it throughout my last two days i need to know what i don't want to hear because it's the only way i can resolve it okay good or bad I need to know about it. So the first thing that, that it's going to happen when I get here is whether it's faculty, staff, or students, whether it's community leaders or community in general, whether it's regents or legislators, we're going to have meetings. Because one, I need to hear from you what you believe are the issues facing the university. And secondly, then I need to tap into your expertise to be able to say to me, this is the low hanging fruit that I think that we could make this university better. Okay? And while that's taking place, we also need to begin to explore. As I said, we need to put forth strategies to stop the hemorrhage to the, to issue, to, to the cuts. Because we can not continue to offset that against tuition for you when there's no more financial aid to be had. You know, I know, if when I was working 40 hours a week, if the tuition went up, I was, I was blessed that my, I, I got an academic scholarship to go there. So if the tuition went up, I didn't so much care. But I still had to worry about books and food and transportation and everything else. For some of you, if the tuition goes up, that's a real issue. You know, and if you're working 40 hours a week and going to school full time, how are you going to work another 10 hours, 50 hours a week to offset the cost of tuition if you don't have the support from scholarships? 
And how are your grades not going to suffer? It, it doesn't compute. You know, so we need to keep the tuition at a level where you can come here so that you can learn for the most, from the best and most talented faculty that the United States have, because they're here. And let there be no doubt about it. The research that's being done here, the cadre of faculty and staff that is present in this institution, having lived my entire life in the 48, I'm telling you, is second to none. The research that's being conducted here is being conducted nowhere else in the world. And you have the opportunity to tap into an expertise that few individuals have the opportunity to tap into. So my job is to get you here, but my job is also to keep that talented and dedicated faculty and staff here to teach you. And so we need to figure out ways to bring in external sources of income. That has been my message. There are various, I think, low-hanging fruits of, of, of strategies that we've implemented from, um, from perhaps commercializing some of the research initiatives of researchers, faculty, and staff creating incubators, accelerators to bring them to market by retaining, by, by giving these individuals support from the university and then keeping a percentage of that company's net profit or, or net worth that in, invariably will come in as external source of income from launching a capital campaign to alumni and to business owners that say, if we tell them, we need you. This is the case for support. This is in the history of this institution. This is when your voice, your money, your, your power will stand up and make a difference. They will come. They will give. They will support. Because if we have a story to tell, and we have a story to tell, they'll remember what it was like to be sitting in that chair as a student, just like I remember what it was like sitting in that chair as a student. You know, but you have to tell the story. And you have to set priorities. And you have to listen to the people. And then you need to take all of that knowledge and then launch it. And you know, and I've said it before, and you need to understand. Tomorrow, if I come in as chancellor, I don't have this magic wand and it's everything. It's not going to go away. I wish I could. It's not. But what I can tell you is that there's an awful lot of intellect and ideas, good ideas, here that we can take to market, that we can capitalize. There's an awful lot of willingness from people to give, and I know that they've given a lot. And I've told the faculty and the staff, I'm not going to tell you that I'm going to come here, I'm going to make your life easier. I'm going to tell you we're going to need just a little bit more from each of you, just for a little bit longer. But there's going to be a light at the end of the tunnel. I think the difference is, right now, people don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. And you're willing to work 20 hours a day, 24 hours a day for a while because of what you believe. But the issue is you need to have a light at the end of the tunnel. And I believe there is a light at the end of the tunnel. But we all need to go come to it together, roll up our sleeves and go to work. And what I can tell you is I'm a roll up a sleeve type of person. <laughs> We have another online question. Um, Alaska's suicide rate is 72% higher than the rest of the nation. Funding is limited for mental health support for UAF students. What are your thoughts on ensuring that students have adequate access to mental health services? You know, again, it's, it's, one of, it's, it's not unlike the, the question about first-generation students. There are, some, um, there, there are some basic services that need to be available to students um, that at any university. Uh, mental health services, there's an increase in, unfortunately, mental health uh, fatalities throughout the nation. This is not just in Alaska. Yes, it has a predominant just because of its climate, but this is not unique to Alaska. Um, we need to find resources to be able to provide students the help that they need when they need it. We need to be able to, and I told the faculty and the staff earlier, we need to be active participants in, the li in each other's lives. Um, we, we can't assume that someone else is going to take care of it because there's someone else coming. You know, for example, we, we talked about safety. If you're walking through campus and a light is off in the trail, 
don't assume that, the, that someone else has already noticed that and is going to fix it. Take the initiative and pick up the phone and say the light is off in the trail. Okay. That's how we can contribute. If you see someone that is <coughs> depressed, that is troubled, don't just assume someone else is going to help. Take the initiative to contact a counselor and say, John needs help. And yes, that means then that we at the university level need to recognize that plight and we need to recognize those needs and we need to funnel funds to be able to properly meet those needs. And education is not just the dissemination of knowledge, I believe. And education is also treating, educating, impacting, touching, nurturing the entire person on a holistic manner. That's body, soul, and spirit, and mind. You know, so each component has to be healthy for us to be able to be participating members of society. That's why you came to an education, to get an education whether it's here or anywhere else. So as administrators, as faculty, as staff, it's our responsibility to find the means to ensure that you get that holistic education that you need, that you're able to grow within your own self, that your mind is able to expand, but also that we, that we when you graduate, have guided your activities and your mindset to a holistic approach, a safe approach, a healthy approach, an intellectually savvy approach to living your world as you enter that meaningful employment. Great, thank you. Any question right here? <laughs> so I was wondering what your on college campuses, we hear a lot about uh, diversity and all different types of diversity, from gender diversity, race diversity, all how we're supposed to be a diverse culture. But one thing I know that college campuses consistently are the least diverse places when it comes to diversity of thought, and not even so much the ability to be able to speak freely, obviously, as we've seen recently. There's instances where the, even now that's being attacked. but. Aside from the ability to, yes, you're allowed to think differently, but college campuses are very focused and uh, on teaching one side of the thought diversity issues, whether it's politically, religiously, whatever. How do you plan on ensuring that UAF is a continues to be and improves its ability to have diversity of thought and to teach students more than just this side of the issue and to let all of the sides of the issue be taught to students. You know, I love you already. Um, <laughs> love you already. Um, because, and that's why I love your generation, because your generation gets it. You all get it. You know, my generation, diversity was gender and ethnicity, period, and a conversation, okay? And I have always tried throughout my years to instill that next component that you spoke of, diversity of thought. Diversity is not just about gender and ethnicity. It's gender, ethnicity, and diversity of thought. And, and you know, even location-wise, you know, from the, the experiences that have shaped your life in and of itself make you a diverse. I think that, that it is because of, of the fact that you see diversity in that triangular manner that I have great expectations for your generation and great hope for your generation because you embrace the differences as, as the norm as opposed to see it as a, as, a, as, a, as a difference, as a handicap. I believe that faculty and staff are beginning to see the world through your eyes instead of through our eyes. Sometimes we, the, the, the more educated administrators, think that we know it all. We don't. I learn from you, from others, each and every day. 
As a matter of fact, that's what I want to do. You know, the only time that I'll stop learning is when I'm six feet under. There is something called um, academic freedom. I'm sure you know of it. That means that faculty have the right in their classroom to teach as they see fit. That is their right. We hire them to be able to share with you their, their intellect, their knowledge. And as human beings, we are an imperfect species. Okay? And so we, right, wrong, or indifferent, have our own biases. And <coughs> while I believe that faculty aim to show you a broad spectrum, it is sometimes difficult to not share with you our own beliefs. Okay? And so finding that good tilt as to what is too much or not enough, that becomes the issue. I think that faculty, staff, administrators always need to be reminded. And they always need to hear, and they want to hear, I believe, your voice. They want to hear that it's not this or that, but maybe this and that. And so what I would say to you is, I would put it back on you. You can go through life either of two ways. You can be a silent observer and just take in, or you can be an active participant and share. So when you see something that you don't agree with, as long as you're respectful, you know, you can say, to, you know, people say to me that I can tell that I can, um, that I can tell someone to take a long walk of a short pier, and they're thanking me. Okay. It's not what you say, but how you say it. Faculty are human beings. Okay, so you can say to them, Doctor So and So, you know, I, I, I've heard what you have to say, but I don't agree with this, and this is why. I'll tell you a story to accentuate that point. My daughter went to an undergraduate school, and my daughter's brain works a little bit different than most of ours because um, she's very bright. She does mathematic pro problems in her head, okay? And so she was sitting in a class, and this tenured professor, one of the very best professors, she had a degree in applied mathematics, um, and, and this professor was in the classroom writing out these formulas and working out this problem, put it out on the board. And here's my daughter who's 17 years old, a freshman in this upper level math applied mathematics class. And she, um, she really doesn't, she's not anything like me. She's very quiet, yeah, not. She said, excuse me, Dr. So-and-so, um, that's wrong. And the professor turned around looked at the screen and said, no, I'm sorry, that's not wrong, that's exactly right. And she said, I'm terribly sorry, sir, that's wrong. And the professor, she tells the story, said, here's the chalk, prove me. And she got up, took it over, rewrote it. The professor looked at it and said, you're absolutely right, I have been doing it wrong all these years. She was 17 years old. So all I'm saying, that's no different. That's diversity. That's diversity. Okay? So it's a reminder. It's, you know, I often say that if you're talking about diversity, you're not living it. Because if you're having an exchange in conversation like we're having, we're living it. We understand it. Okay? If we don't have it, then we're assuming, we're forcing it, and that's where the issues become. Thank you. All right, we have time for one more question. <coughs> Any questions there? Yeah, good morning. Good um, morning. Apologize for being late. It's okay. <laughs> uh, I'm just wondering what your stance is on the, or your position rather, on adjunct faculty. Um, one of the budget cut measures that we're taking is like letting people retire and not hiring full professorships and um, you know I don't want to talk 
badly about adjunct professors because there's really great ones, but um, on their side of the things, the pay is really low and there's very little benefits. On the student side of things, it's inconsistent at best. You don't have a dedicated uh, person that's there year after year and, you know, to help advise and mentor a student. Um, but it is, it does make sense financially. So how do you strike the balance between mm -hmm. our budget woes and uh, this situation? Well, you know, um, there, there are roles, faculty roles um, at any institution are driven to provide the very best knowledge and instill the very best wisdom onto students. I believe the curricula belongs to the faculty and there needs to be a good balance between the full-time faculty and an adjunct faculty. Adjunct faculty pay, play a tremendous role in being able to educate students because often they bring in, especially in the professional uh, areas, a view of the world that some of the faculty may not have. Um, and, and there has to be a coordination. Uh, the coordination is if we follow the stands that curricula belong to the faculty, which I believe it does, and if the faculty design the curricula, which I believe they should, and if faculty and deans in the specific departments hired qualified credentialed adjuncts, which I believe they should, then the rigor and the strength and the quality of the programs as measured by assessment and outcomes, which should be the same across the board, will be the same. In my previous institution, we use adjunct faculty. And because full-time faculty designed the course, <coughs> ensure it's rigored, looked at the assessment, same assessment, whether online, on-site, full-time faculty, part-time faculty, or adjunct faculty, was the same and outcomes were the same. <coughs> the standing of our programs and the satisfaction of our students actually went up. It's an issue of control, and it's an issue of leverage, okay? I would argue with you that, a f that we need to be careful that full-time faculty are not overburdened by overloads. You know, you cannot possibly teach four courses and do advising and do research and publish when you're teaching four or two or when you're teaching six or seven or eight per semester. There has to be a mitigation. So it's not just an issue of, of funding, which yes, certainly has to be taken into consideration. It's not just an issue of the difference between the overload and the, and the adjunct pay, which yes, has to be taken into consideration. It's an issue of the quality that for that faculty and their responsibilities, I can't get them to a point of, of, of breaking. The faculty need to be able to teach, do service, and, do re and, and publish, or do research. And when one of those three triads begins to get too imbalanced, then something has to suffer. So it's for me as an administrator is finding that equilibrium of when is it that we need to bring in an adjunct. You know, how is it that we can maximize the use of full-time faculty, you know, by, by setting, by saying these are the, um, um, the, the courses that you can teach and at what point do we have an overload, you know, do, can, because the reality of it is we have to have the courses for the students to graduate on time, you know. If the courses are not there, it's a cause of attrition, as you well know. Uh, it's, also a, it, it's also not fair to the students. So how do we mitigate that? I don't have a percentage. Obviously, there are percentages that are driven by accreditation, okay? But it's a conversation, and that conversation may change from one department to another one based on its needs. I am not a one-size-fits-all person. I'm not, because 
there are some courses that need more of this than that. There's others that need more of that than this. And, and my responsibility is to listen to you and say, let you make your argument for I need this, this, and this for my students as it is for me to let the other faculty say I need this, this, and this for my students and then integrate that with the adjunct faculty. Again, the role of adjunct faculty is critical. They bring expertise to our institution that many of us do not know. Uh, they bring dedication to, to the institution and they also offset some of the needs for our full-time faculty to be able to then take the institution to, from great to extraordinary because the nature and the purpose of your research gives visibility to this institution and attracts students that are second to none which themselves will give visibility to this institution. Thank you for asking. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Thank you. Um, and unfortunately, we have uh, been getting the, the, the nod. <laughs> the, the nod. Um, so we do have to wrap it up. Um, just a, a few things I would like to share with the folks in the room and online. Um, and we will have uh, an opportunity for you to provide feedback back to the search committee on the, the Chancellor Search website. And that opportunity will be available until 5 p.m. next Wednesday. Um, so uh, with that, this, this is the last you'll hear from me. I'll, I will let Dr. Martin close us off. Thank you, um, uh, um, thank you, uh, thank you. for your time and for sharing with us. Um, and I'll thank let you, 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 let you thank close you. us off. Well, all I would like to say is um, thank you for coming out here today. It's wonderful to see all of you. Continue to be the voice for those who do not have one. Continue your education. When you graduate as an undergraduate, look at, look at it as just the beginning of your adventure. Remember that you have a voice and choose to execute the voice. Remember that the best is yet to be. Remember that there was somebody here one day, whether I come here or not, but there was somebody here one day to challenge you to remember, to be always your best self, to think of others before self, and to remember that when you get to that penthouse, to send that elevator back down. Thank you for coming here today.